convulse with fury as the senseless greed of limitless capitalist expansion implodes the global economy, as our civil liberties are eviscerated in the name of national security, shackling us to an interconnected security and surveillance apparatus that stretches from Moscow to Istanbul to New York. How shall we endure? How shall we resist? Our hope lies in the human imagination. It was the human imagination that permitted African Americans during slavery and the Jim Crow era to transcend their physical condition. It was the human imagination that sustained Sitting Bull and Black Elk as their land was seized and their cultures were broken. And it was the human imagination that allowed the survivors in the Nazi death camps to retain the power of the sacred. It is the human imagination that makes possible transcendence, chants, work songs, spirituals, the blues, poetry, dance, and art converged under slavery to nourish and sustain this imagination. These were the forces that, as Ralph Ellison wrote, we had in place of freedom. Now, the oppressed would be the first, for they know their fate, to admit that on a rational level such a notion is absurd. But they also know that it is only through the human imagination that they can survive. Jewish inmates in Auschwitz reportedly put God on trial for the Holocaust and then condemned God to death. A rabbi stood after the verdict to lead everyone in evening prayers. African Americans, Native Americans, indigenous communities for centuries had little control over their destinies. Forces of bigotry and violence kept them subjugated by whites. Suffering for the oppressed was tangible. Death was a constant companion, and it was only their imagination as William Faulkner noted at the end of The Sound and the Fury, that permitted them, unlike the novel's white Compson family, to endure. The theologian James Cone captures this in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Cone says that for oppressed blacks, the cross was a paradoxical religious symbol because it inverts the world's value system with the news that hope comes by way of defeat, that suffering and death do not have the last word, that the last shall be first and the first last. Cohn continues that God could make a way out of no way, and Jesus' cross was truly absurd to the intellect, yet profoundly real in the souls of black folk. Enslaved blacks who first heard the gospel message seized on the power of the cross. Christ crucified manifested God's loving and liberating presence in the contradictions of black life. That transcendent presence in the lives of black Christians that empowered them to believe that ultimately, in God's eschatological future, they would not be defeated by the troubles of this world, no matter how great and painful their suffering. Believing this paradox, this absurd claim of faith, was only possible in humility and repentance. There was no place for the proud and the mighty, for people who think that God called them to rule over others. The cross was God's critique of power, white power, with powerless love, snatching victory out of defeat. Reinhold Niebuhr labeled this capacity to defy the forces of repression as a sublime madness in the soul. Niebuhr wrote that nothing but madness will do battle with malignant power and spiritual wickedness in high places. This sublime madness, madness as Niebuhr understood, is dangerous, but it is vital. Without it, truth is obscured. 
And Niebuhr also knew that traditional liberalism was a useless force in moments of extremity. Liberalism, Niebuhr said, lacks the spirit of enthusiasm, not to say fanaticism, which is so necessary to move the world out of its beaten tracks. It is too intellectual and too little emotional to be an effective force in history. The prophets in the Hebrew Bible had this sublime madness. The words of the Hebrew prophets, as Abraham Heschel wrote, were a scream in the night. While the world is at ease and asleep, the prophet feels the blast from heaven. The prophet, because he or she saw and faced an unpleasant reality, was, as Heschel wrote, compelled to proclaim the very opposite of what his or her heart expected. Primo Levi, in his memoir, Survival in Auschwitz, tells of teaching Italian to another inmate, Jean Samuel, in exchange for lessons in French. Levi recites to Samuel from memory, Canto 26 of Dante's The Inferno. It is the story of Ulysses' final voyage. We cheered, but soon that cheering turned to woe. For then a whirlwind born from the strange land battered our little vessel on the prow. Three times the boat and all the sea were whirled, and at the fourth, to please another's will, the aft tipped in the air. The prow went down until the ocean closed above our bones. He has received the message Levy wrote of his friend and what they shared in Dante. He has felt that it has to do with him, that it has to do with all who toil, and with us in particular. Levy goes on. It is vitally necessary and urgent that he listen, that he understand, before it is too late. Tomorrow, he or I might be dead, or we might never see each other again. The poet Leon Staff wrote from inside the Warsaw Ghetto, even more than bread, we now need poetry in a time when it seems that it is not needed at all. It is only those who harness their imagination and through their imagination find the courage to peer into the molten pit who can minister to the suffering of those around us.